Okay, so we have reached chapter 7 of the chapter of uh, Acts, the book of Acts. But uh, we're going to start off with some review from chapter 6, mm -hmm. from chapter 6. And then we'll uh, let a professional read most of chapter 7. <laughs> and uh, we'll pick it up at the, at the end. So uh, bring it on, Robert. Okay. Um, well, in chapter 6, we were, we were talking about all the... The different uh, this when they talk about the different synagogues, the, the synagogue of the freedmen and the oh, yeah, right, right. Alexandrians, Cilicians, Asia. I, <clears throat> so I was I was looking that up and, and kind of looking at where where these places were and um, kind of understanding something too that that Stephen was one of the one of the people because these were the greek hebrews that were that were being uh, passed over in the daily distribution and it was basically the greek widows that's right the hellenists hellenists yeah and and then so and then by the way the the word helen where they get the hellenist uh or hellenistic is uh helen is the was the name of a uh, <clears throat> of a man from Greek um, Greek mythology, and uh, that's where it's it's basically the name for for Greece. We call it Greece, but in that part of the world, it's known as uh, Helena. I think is the way, the way Helena <clears throat> is the way it's. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but. Um, so they were they were known as Hellenists or okay. yeah so well, they could have called them Grecians then yeah basically if I mean translated over if it was more of an English yeah a Grecian would be the English version of that and so uh, so the Hellenists um, so Stephen was one of them right so I was wondering that. Uh, so all these groups that were opposing him because he was just ministering to his basically to his own people mm -hmm. so you're talking in verse 9 is what you're referencing right yeah and where stephen was part of these these men that they chose to preside over the distribution of the the things that were brought in and and given to the apostles and and so but stephen was so they were greek men we we, we remember that they oh, chose all greek men right yeah, yeah. So Stephen was one of them. So he's Greek, right? He's a Greek Hebrew. So I'm. I was looking at these these uh, what they call the synagogue of, and so it's basically these are several different synagogues. And I was thinking, all right, these must be uh, factions of possibly Greeks. But so there were. Uh, so I looked up the the, the freedmen. The, depending on, I was just I was just looking this up on Wikipedia. I'm not going very deep but anyway just looking up on wikipedia said that they were probably freed slaves uh or descendants of the freed slaves from rome and uh this was i think it was 63 bc there was a siege of judea and rome took a lot of captives and during from that siege and they they said that these were probably descendants of uh the the ones that were freed from that captivity so these were just descendants of slaves that came back from rome um or maybe the word freedmen was also maybe that was a kind of general term for people from all over because jewish slaves were taken all over the world they were taken mm -hmm. to syria they were taken to egypt they were you know throughout the history so they could have been slave, you know descendants of slaves but they were Wikipedia, I think, is referencing this because uh, that was probably the most recent, you know, uh, return from captivity. So they were in that day to be known as freedmen. So, so they, and then um, then the Cyrenians, the the city of Cyrene in, is in Libya, which North Africa, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a funny story where this. Uh, uh, 
Sarim was a city that was founded by, uh, not by <coughs> North African people, but by a, a Greek philosopher, a Greek person who uh, was fairly well known, and he went to the Oracle of Delphi, and um, she told him to go and go to this, uh, go to move to uh, this area in Libya, North Africa. And eventually, him and his followers made it to this to this area, which had was, was abundant in rain and so on, and uh, founded this city. And it was a colony that got started, and eventually became um, kind of like Alexandria. It became known for what it was, and there was they, they basically were Epicureans. They were uh, an Epicureanism as a philosophy and so on. But anyway, that was so it was known as this. But very, you know, philosophical. They follow this Epicurean philosophy is more like, they, they, at first was hedonism, but it was more, uh, it, be, it was more a, a philosophy of um, following the pleasures of life, you know, and e that's Epicurean philosophy. But they were, uh, they, they were pretty serious about it. it. Wasn't just, you know, party hardy. It was, they lived according to that to that idea. Um, and then Alexandria, of course, we know is in Egypt and major Hellenistic culture there. So you have Hellenistic culture, except for maybe Rome, but the, the freedmen from Rome were, were, had returned from Rome. And so I'm still thinking this is, a lot of this is just Hellenistic culture. Um, Cilicia is Southeast Turkey. So if, if you're thinking of where Turkey's at, just north of modern day Israel, right in right at that corner of the Mediterranean, that's where Cilicia was. And then when it says Asia, that's Asia Minor, which is Turkey, right? Mm -hmm. So that so basically Turkey, um, the North Africa, and possible, and then the freedmen from Rome. So they, I'm thinking that these were men that were um, of different different communities in Jerusalem. And so they, why they were there, I'm, I'm assuming they were living there and developed their own synagogue. They kind of had their own culture from the areas that they, but they were all Hellenistic in a sense, but they were, they came from their own communities. And so they had their own ideas. And so they, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm just speculating here, but they, I'm saying that they were had the kind of their own representation in the different synagogues with their own people, but they would still be kind of. I'm still thinking that they knew Stephen, and Stephen was was a Hellenist in a sense because he's taking care of these people, and so I'm just putting pieces together in my head and thinking how this might happen. But so they they were opposing Stephen. And I'm thinking uh, because of one thing it said in, in the Wikipedia was about the freedmen, that these guys might. Uh, it's it said in the article that they were uh, probably very um, staunch, staunchly held on to their Judaism. So they were, in other words, they were slaves in Rome, but they kind of staunchly held on to their Judaism. So they were kind of proud of that. So when they come back. And if they're in Jerusalem having their own synagogue, um, they would be uh, maybe not necessarily uh, more patriotic in a sense. Maybe not necessarily like the Pharisees or you know th those that lived in Jerusalem, you know that were born in Jerusalem, might not be very religious that way, but yet were very proud of the fact that they had maintained their Judaism. Um, I'm so I'm thinking that maybe. Maybe that's kind of what was going on is that there's all these synagogues, but they they weren't necessarily accepted by the homegrown Jews from Judea, right? Mm -hmm. These are all like people that have come back from the Hellenistic world. And they so they didn't quite mix with all the, the Jews. I'm just, and like I said, I'm just putting this together in my head. But so they, they had a bone to pick with Stephen for, and I'm thinking for what reason? Was it because they were overzealous about their their own brand of Judaism. In other words, they didn't agree with what he was doing with the widows or um, 
they were just holding on to Jewish tradition. And, you know, then they drag him before the Sanhedrin and accuse him. But it, it's, it's funny how this, it's all within the same, I'm thinking within the same Hellenistic faction of, of, of Jewish synagogues. Well, Stephen was embracing, as it says here, this Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they were opposed to that, big, probably big time. That was probably one of their the things that they held against Stephen himself because I mean that's what they started throwing threats about you know that this Jesus will destroy this place change your customs that Moses delivered to us and so forth so that's probably part of it at least if you know yeah threatening, threatening their way of life Right, and in their beliefs, mm -hmm. whatever they were ha hanging on to, however much of it they were hanging on. Well, I think it was a lot because Stephen in chapter seven is going to start going through all the things that they're that they're holding probably dear to them. You know, he's covering, he's doing the cliff notes of the Old Testament thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. yeah, and he. Um... And so I'm wondering if the, when they stoned him, if these were the men that were stoning him, not not necessarily the Sanhedrin themselves, but mm -hmm. the ones that accused him. Um, they were just kind of like given, you know, the charge, go ahead and deal with it, you know, go yeah. out. And it's like, the, so Stephen was really being a, a force in his own, in his own culture, in his own community. And, um, and he paid the price for that. Um, and it was just like, you know, amongst his own people, he was not accepted kind of thing. Yeah, I can, I can see that um, if he was uh, challenging them. Well, I, I can see it the fact that from the Pharisees' point of view, where they hated Jesus, but they got, but they got the uh, Romans to do their dirty work. Well, he's another follower of Jesus to get somebody else to do the dirty work so that it's not on our hands. No, it is, but... You know. Well, that's, that's what they were trying to do back with Pilate, too. Get yeah. somebody else to yes. do the dirty work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. They even made it funny. That I, if, I, if I get it correct, when they were talking to Pilate and, and saying, crucify, crucify, they said, may his blood be on our hands, or our heads. Yeah. Then later on, we nothing to do with that. We're not guilty of that. His blood's not on our hands. Like you just said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so own up to it. Yeah, exactly. You have your record. <laughs> okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna let the nice gentleman read, uh, starting at chapter seven, and uh, we'll pick it up where he leaves off. And the high priest said. Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them four hundred years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac, and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him, and rescued him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, 
Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all his kindred, seventy-five persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem, and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day he appeared to them as they were quarreling, and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers, why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now when forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for forty years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered a sacrifice to the idol, and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away, and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch, and the star of your god Rephan, the images that you made to worship and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob but it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, 
or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? Okay, now that we've heard him read that for us, uh, Robert has something else to share about chapter 7. I, it, just in different places where Stephen was talking about, he, uh, when he referred to um, Moses at the burning bush or the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness, he refers to an angel that delivered, you know, that, that uh, it says, Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness in Mount Sinai and a flame of fire in the bush, in a bush. So it's, he, that Moses, it, the way he says it is kind of like Moses heard the word of the Lord, but it was an angel that was in the, that manifested. And then uh, later on in the wilderness, in the wilderness wandering, it says that, um, that it was a, an angel. I, I don't know if I can find the exact one, but oh here, the, uh, and you are coming the, the the coming of the righteous one whom you have betrayed and murdered, who received the law as delivered by angels, and did not keep it. So the law being delivered by angels. So he's, and I just thought that was maybe maybe that was one way of of thinking about it because I remember that we always think of the pillar of fire as God himself, but maybe that in a sense was, you know, God using angels to manifest himself. But um, anyway, somehow in the, in the uh, and I, when I looked at it in Bible Hub, they were saying that it was God delivering through angels or God using an angelic, uh, uh, like angelic a means. And so th that it's interpreted as coming from God but the 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 language that is used is sometimes they would say angel delivered by angels oh i know in the old testament there was there's the terms an angel of the lord and the angel of the lord yeah. which a lot of people say was was uh was was christ mm -hmm. uh, Epiphany. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah right right exactly and then, yeah so they it could be that uh like Melchizedek and so on that, that you know the the pre Christ appearance well, I think stuff, it was yeah. Jesus yeah myself yeah yeah um, and then the other thing was uh, it was just this whole thing about that um, in verse thirty seven that this this is Moses who said to the Israelites God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is one who was in the in the congregation of the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai. So again, the angel, and with father and with our fathers, who received living oracles to give to us. And uh, just because at at first that whole thing was like, was he talking about Moses or was he talking about Jesus? You know, it, but it was it was talking about Moses being with the congregation in Mount Mount Sinai, but it was Moses was prophesying, saying, "They're going, you're going to receive another one like me." And um, but then this other line that said he received living oracles to give to us, and I was wondering what that word oracle meant. Um, and the oracles are, are I, there's the word logos. Mm -hmm. which is is like a bigger broader term that, that refers to the word right and and this is um, logion I think is was the word which is like a small word it's like a snippet it's not it's not like Rama Rama is like from a living voice like someone mm -hmm. speaking you know giving Rama you know or yeah. giving a Rama but this is like a logion this is like a little kind of like a just a small piece of a, a specific word and so they receive living oracles, so and so it could be, but kind of like proverbs or something. Proverbs would be like oracles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about Moses and the burning bush, I you know God's in scripture here is saying in, in Exodus, um, when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the burning bush. 
So it's that, that God called to him from the bush. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was the Lord. Just by the way he was talking, my, you know, my people. And then Moses asked him, who shall I say sent me? And then, you know, it's, it's God talking, not an angel. And the other reason, the other reason that I believe it's God, mm -hmm. because when he comes closer, he tells them, take off your shoes because you're on holy ground. Most of the time when people meet angels, the angels don't tell them to take their shoes off. But in the presence of God, he says, take off your shoes because you're on holy ground. Right. So I think it was, um, Scripture said it was, it was God. And what got me when he was talking about, you know, the, the whole thing with air and make us gods who will go before us and, you know, this man Moses who led us out from Egypt, we don't know what will become of him. And they made a calf in those days and Aaron, Aaron was involved in this. It, it goes to show you how quickly the human heart can change and oh, yeah. wander off, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And I was talking to this guy this weekend, and I was sure telling him this, this: if you have a circle this big, and in the middle, and you have just take out one degree, it's just a little sliver. Mm -hmm. But the further you go out, that one degree starts spreading and spreading, and before you know it, you're way off mm -hmm. by one degree, <clears throat> way off of that road, that narrow, straight and narrow path you should be on. Yeah, and. We blame them, and it's easy to, you know, to look at them and say, how could that possibly be? But we do it all the time. Yeah, and you think about it, 400 years of being inundated with Egyptian gods and culture. And you think about ourselves, you know, how quickly we can fall away. 400 years of that. Well, they had 40 years of it. But then they just saw the part, the, the Red Sea part, and God provide manna. I mean, they they're coming off of some powerful things that they saw God's hand doing. You know what I mean? But they, and they still forgot about that and go to their making idols so that they could worship. And it's just to me, it's like yeah, that's you know, just speaks, it speaks of human nature. You know, we just I think so quickly yeah. can just if we don't have faith and walk by faith is quickly we can change i think that's why we we're told to put off the old man yeah and put on the new man you know because the old man's just gonna lead us astray i mean i've i've certainly found that out yeah if you think about it, they came out of the desert and they are now in the wilderness and moses is gone for what almost a month Long time, whatever. Yeah. Right? And then they're like, okay, 40 we're... days, I think. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. So, like, okay, we're here and we know what this guy's doing. Yeah. We don't know if he's going to even come back. Yeah. So, I can, you know, it, yeah, just human nature. You're going to, you're going to doubt. And we have the fullness of the scripture and we still doubt at times. They were just walking it out. Yeah. And so I can totally see how they were just easily. Yeah, we have a lot of hindsight. Yeah, it's so easy for to say, oh, why would they do that? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's what I'm saying. People haven't changed from back then no. to now. They're nope. still the same. Yeah, exactly. That's why his mercies are new every morning. <laughs> I'm so glad they are. Okay, Robert, do you have anything else for, there for chapter 7? I didn't mean to cut you off. But... I was just, I was looking at um, the or it references here Amos and it said that um, as is written in the book of the prophets um, and it, it says you didn't uh, did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness O house of Israel you took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Rephan and images that you made to worship and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon and the Moloch was a bull so that's where the golden calf comes mm. in. And there's speculation as to, you know, where they say that, you know, they made the children pass through the fire. Was that, was it because Moloch was used as a uh, god where they sacrificed children? And there's a, there's a lot about that. Or as some said that maybe it was more like a, uh, a dedication <coughs> and where they would, you know, pass the child through the flame as kind of like a 
a ceremony to dedicate their life to that deity. Um, but um, there's a lot. There's there's a lot of uh, people that say that that there was, you know, child sacrifice, uh, mm -hmm. you know, actual. Yeah. Uh, and then the Star of Refan um, was probably re referenced to um, the, the it traces back to Saturn, and Saturn is just kind of like was one of the one of if not the top god that's represented in uh, uh, kind of the the planetary cosmos, you know, the hierarchy of of gods represented by stars. And so, and it's possibly could be the star that, or a mark that was on the forehead of Moloch, which represented a star. Um, so, it's all. I think it's all part of the same uh, uh, cult of you know idolatry. You know. Well, he certainly he certainly had a lot to say to these these uh, these Hellenists who were uh, trying to antagonize him. Um, and verse I'll go back to verse fifty one actually and start there. Where Steve, Stephen now says, "You stiff necked people." After he just got through hearing stuff that they were like probably, you know, going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's now starting to change tone a little bit. And he says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. Whom you have now betrayed and murdered, and you received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So he's making it a little personal now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any comment on that one little section there? Is it the fact that you no, know, God kept saying His words to the prophets and other ways, and they just would not relent from their beliefs and sins. And even God, and even here when he tells them, this is the history. So there's no doubting. This is the history, our history, and how God said these things are going to happen. And yet you still refuse to believe. You hold into your religious ways, but there's no life in you. Well, one thing's for sure that in every... Every time that, that Jesus or one of the apostles is opposed by, by a Jewish uh, group, they, you, can just, you can just tell by what is said that they have, they're, they're very, um, we would call it today patriotic, but then it, it was like they were very, you know, zealous for their culture, you know, mm -hmm. and, they, and their history and everything. So they saw it in one way, you know, mm -hmm. and... So Stephen saying, you know, you're the ones who killed the prophets. You're, you know, and you know, they, I think they're they're seeing themselves as, you know, we are God's people, and you know, we're being occupied by these evil heathen nations and so on, and and God's going to vindicate us and so on, and and Stephen's trying to say, no, you need to you need to own up to to uh, what what really happened and understand that who Jesus is mm -hmm. and and repent and you know um, and I, I think that that's it was that's the one thing that just blinds their like Paul said there's a veil on their heart you know mm -hmm. they just they just can't receive it you know, one of the sad things I know if, if they would just look back in their history to see how they have failed before and how God dispersed them and ask them, so have we done the same thing again? Oh yeah, we have. That's why we're where we are now. So if you just, you have a track record of doing things where God said, I'll bless you or curse you, and you've done the thing that caused you to go into bondage, 
So you would think that they would look back in the history, but like you said, like we're 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 great Jews, but we what we never did those things. Like they said, you no, know, <clears throat> um, early chapters. But we're 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 not in bondage to anyone. We're talking about your the Romans on you right now. I mean, how do you say you're not enslaved to anyone? Yeah, you are. <laughs> you're not free right now. You're <laughs> you're in bondage. Just that the blindness. Or just, or just the delusion of what the reality of where they really are. Like us. Yes, right? I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I say that. Well, Sounds yeah. like us. <laughs> uh, when, you're, when you're reading this kind of stuff, you've got to see yourself in there. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you're one of those ones that they're, you're reading about, you know? Yes, <laughs> yeah. Verse 54 says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him and the wilderness laid down and and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul and as they were stoning Stephen he called out Lord Jesus receive my spirit and falling to his knees he cried out with a loud voice O Lord do not hold this sin against them and when he had said this he fell asleep I see two things there. One, <clears throat> incredible, they're, they're upset with him, and he looks up, and there's Jesus at the right hand of God. And what was he saying? Like, good job. Well, what was he saying? He's, he's just giving him, and as he's testifying about him, almost what expression Jesus had in his face of what, what he was communicating with them. And it's like a bit of encouragement. That's the that's a major encouragement right there. Well, and he was standing. <clears throat> Yeah. Almost every, I think every other instance you read about Jesus, he's seated at the right yeah. hand of God. But Jesus is standing hand. there. Yeah. So I'm going to be standing there and, and just encouraging him or standing there and looking at them who's ready to kill him and saying, don't touch my beloved. I mean, I don't know. The scripture could tells have been Stephen had like, woken, woken, welcoming him yeah. into the next phase, you know, the, yeah. that we're all going to end up going into. Yeah, well, Jesus stood up and said, you know, I'm proud. You stood for me. You. Yeah, so interestingly, <clears throat> he didn't give much more of a strict description other than heaven's open, son of man standing at the right hand of God. Yeah, but how was he, like you said, how was, what, what was he seeing? What, you know, was he just... You know, stand in there. I don't think so. I think he was probably saying, you "Yeah, know, yeah. You, 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 you run the race. You've done what I called you to do. I'm ready to receive you home." And so, he, that means he saw God too, then, because he saw him standing at the right hand of God. Yeah, but it, whatever that looked like to him, he saw. I mean, if it, it was just his glory, or whatever it was, he saw it. Yeah, and uh, but I like he also even he said, "Lord, do not hold this sin against them." That shows his compassion for his own people. That you know, mm -hmm. though you though they have done wrong, he's like, "I love my people, and I want them to be saved. So do not charge them with this." Hoping that at some point they'll come to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and that's that's the kind of heart you know God wants us to have. That those who come against us is to cry out for them, Lord. They have no clue, and they really don't have any clue of of how and why they're rejecting Christ and what what they're truly rejecting, the, what God has for them. And um, I mean, Jesus said the same thing. So it's like, yeah, we don't walk in an offense because we're going to go through something like this, or however that might be for us individually. But a heart is that you no, know, Lord, these are these are my fellow family members or Americans or wherever it might be, classmates, Lord, 
have mercy on him. Have mercy on him. Yeah, same thing Jesus said. Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. And real in reality, they didn't really know what they're doing. And you know, in retrospect, they knew what they were doing by stoning them. Yeah. But if they only really knew why they were doing it. Yeah. Here, the hardness of their hearts and their sin, you know. Mm -hmm. And how they were being used by the enemy to. Yeah. It's just sad. I was, I'm just thinking about how, you know, how did these, how did these guys come to, come to know of Stephen and, you know, maybe they were have family members that were being converted, you know, mm -hmm. and, or they were like, like you see on the Temple Mount today where you have different, different sects of, of, uh, Orthodox Jews, you know, and you got the ones with the fur hats, and you got the ones with the flat hats, and the, you know, you got all these different <coughs> kinds of, of um, from different schools of thought in the Jewish community, and maybe so it was kind of like you know these synagogues in a sense were little f groups of men that were coming and you know milling around in the temple court and kind of getting their own little group going, and you know maybe they saw you know what was going on with the apostles and Stephen. But you know Stephen being kind of one of them, you know, one of their of their ethnic persuasion, um, just you know, you know, I'm thinking, why would they oppose something that was going on, and you know, they just why weren't they just doing their own thing, you know? Mm -hmm. But they and but they when they got together, they they didn't have a problem lying about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. They they were they were treacherous and they lied about him and they exaggerated like crazy. Um, I mean, they just didn't like him. They just they were gonna. And but then Stephen was, I think that you know when it says that he when he brought him for the council that he his face shone like an angel. Right. So he something came over him and he was he was. He was like under the anointing of the spirit, I think, mm -hmm. and through this whole thing. And then at the end, you know, there was such a heavy anointing, I think, on Stephen personally that that you know he has that vision, and you know, heaven's open and he sees Jesus, and um, and I've heard I've heard it prophesied by different different prophets there that uh, when there is a they. Prophesy that there's persecution coming, and that in their vision that they've seen themselves die, um, and that but that Jesus at that moment appears to them and speaks to them, and they don't feel the pain or they don't remember the pain of mm -hmm. the of the moment uh, of the moment of the execution. Yeah, and so it's I that could be you know a foreshadowing of, of things to come. But it it was I think it was something that Jesus knew. I was thinking, you know, why why didn't uh, why didn't Stephen explain things a little bit more? I know he gave a lot of history, but he didn't really quite come out and say, you know, Jesus is the Messiah you're looking for. You know? <laughs> but yet he he kind of did. But it's you know they um, but they were already de dead set against him. They were, yeah. But that that was the final straw when he said he saw Jesus standing next to the. You know, because according to a Jew, you you don't even really say the name of God. Yeah. You know, you use a different term. You don't mm -hmm. really say you know the name of God because that is blasphemy. You know, to, mm -hmm. for a common man. So to say, and it says, you know, in the in the Old Testament, no man can see God and live. You know, so for him to claim that he sees God and Jesus standing next to him, it's like, yeah, that was all they could take, and that was it. Yeah. There. Yeah. And then, who's there? So I think I think Saul, who would become Paul, I think he had was already making a name for themselves because they were laying down their garments at his feet. So I think I think they had a lot of respect for Paul. Yeah, I think at this time, were they already persecuting churches? Yeah, 
and and, and uh, evidently the, they were they were behind what he was doing because I mean they were throwing their garments at his feet and uh, I guess we'll find out more about Paul it is coming up in this next chapter but um, I don't think it's just some young kid that was standing there and was like throwing the garments, you know, haphazardly. I think yeah. there was some kind of respect thing going on here. It wasn't like they they were saying, "Here, hold my coat." All right, yeah, I this yeah, guy. Yeah, put you know, these jackets on. He's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, if, <laughs> in a sense, if you think about it, the, they laid their garments at his feet. This might be a kind of. Uh, casting a mantle on someone you know kind of like we're choosing this guy you know yeah you are a man you are a man yeah, yeah. like you're going to be our champion and it said in, in the first verse of chapter 8 it says and Paul and Saul approved of this of his execution so Which to me it leads again me to think that you know they were looking to him to see what mm -hmm his approval you know which leads me to believe that they they had some kind of respect and admiration whatever was they looked up to him yeah yeah and he was a you know we read about him he's pharisee of pharisees and mm -hmm. you know very strict and so I'm sure they were just loving that. Well, and you see what he did as a Christian. So you can imagine what he was like as a Pharisee. Right. Yeah, he was very influential. It must have been. I think God just turned his compass but left the heat on, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, just, just like, okay, now you're going that way. Yeah. But you have the same yeah. zeal, you yeah, know. The same person had the same passion just now is, is directed for God to use. Yeah. I think a lot of people think that, oh, you become a Christian, become docile. Like, no, you're going to still be who you are. You're just going to be serving serving God. Yeah. Yep. A whole new, whole new outlook. A whole new paradigm shift. Yes. As they say. There, there are some guys that have a leadership ability that is tenacious. And um, they... You know, when you say they make good leaders, it's because they're, um, they're, they're, they're not so eloquent as they are, you know, very, uh, very confident and very, you know, and people follow them <clears throat> immediately. And it, there's, there's a, a certain quality, you know, where I, I analyze things and I think about things, you know, and I formulate things and, you know, and I come up with ideas, but it's like, you know, a person that can lead is, is a different skill. And yeah. Paul just, you know, was, you know, and people look to him, you can tell, you know, people just automatically look into him as the one to carry out this task. And um, yeah, like you said, they had respect for him. And yeah, we're all giving gifts. And so no what we're doing about repentance, the gift stays. It's a matter of how we use them and for whom we use them. Yep. And that, you know, that leadership ability carried over into the church and, you know, how Paul was, you know, he just, I'm thinking of like, like Robert Kiyosaki, who's writing financial books, but he was a Marine. And I'm thinking, well, why was he, a, well, as a Marine, you know, Marines, hoorah, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. and, and so it makes sense that he would be a guy that would be, you know, multimillionaire and writing who knows how many books he's got now. And, you know, it's like that kind of personality just doesn't back down, just you know, like you say, just shifts gears, you know, turns the compass and just keeps on going. You know? Yeah. Okay, gentlemen. Next week, we, we, uh, next time we meet, we'll be in uh, chapter eight. Okay. And uh, then chapter 9, we get to see Paul get saved. So with that all said, have a great week, rest of the week.
see you next time. Okay. Yes. <laughs>